And Larry, thank you very much for taking time out of your very busy schedule. Uh, you're directing Holding the Man, which we'll talk about shortly. But thank you so much for your time with us today. Listen, I'm always happy anybody wants to talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And thank you to you all as well and to everybody who is watching this uh, in Australia and New Zealand. Thank you to you all. All right. Um, Larry, I'd like to go back a bit, if we could, to when you were 11 years old. <laughs> <laughs> If you can take your mind back, you tell a beautiful story. Um, it's very touching about a young adolescent boy in the height of summer cycling to a cinema in North Hollywood, the El Portal. El Portal, yeah. El Portal, to see James Dean in East of Eden. And it was a very pivotal moment for you as a young boy. Can you tell us why it was such a profound, made such a profound impact upon you? Well. If you've seen East of Eden, I think you all know the impact of James Dean on the adolescence at my time in life. Um, Post-World War II, the family, uh, the sons kind of left the fathers. There was this, this schism between fathers and sons, and I certainly had it with my dad. He was a businessman. He traveled a great deal. I didn't see him a lot. And um, it's complicated, too complicated to go into other than to say I watch James Dean express extraordinarily uh, the pain of not being able to make contact and the puritanical father not seeing his yearning for that closeness and it, it was very much like my own experience and uh, he was so alive, James Dean, he was so sensitive and so free physically because he, he, you know, he, he uh, worked with uh, Catherine Dunham, a great Afro-Cuban dance teacher. All the actors took dance class then and he studied animals. He was particularly fascinated by working with cats. So he had this incredible phys physical aliveness. Even if you see East of Eden, there's, a, there's a, 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 a moment where he's on a train and he's just very cold and he takes his sweater and he tries to warm up his arms. His physical uh, expression of his inner world was unlike anybody I had ever seen. And it shocked me and it scared me and it, it made me feel that acting was an important experience for the audience, that it wasn't just about narcissism, you know, it wasn't just about look at, look at me, look at me, it was about storytelling. And so James Dean broke my heart opened my heart, got me off my ass. It's the only time at that point I lied to my parents in order to see James Dean. I, uh, I uh, didn't tell them where I was going. It was 25 cents to get into the theater. I plunked my 25 cents down and it changed my life. You said that it was really the birth of you being connected to this desire and dream to become an actor. And then another moment for you was when you were 15 years of age, you saw the astonishing Kim oh, Stanley. I know exactly. In a far country, and it was the intensity of the emotional life oh that God. you witnessed. I, I tell you, if you saw the great Kim Stanley live, there's a movie you have to see, The Goddess. Anybody here ever see the movie The Goddess? Yep. Yes. All right, now you listen to me and don't annoy me. <laughs> you go and you get a copy of The Goddess. Then get a copy of Seance on a Wet Afternoon and just sit there and go, oh, oh, I see. A Far Country was a play about Freud's first patient with hysterical paralysis. She can't walk and there's no physical reason why. The doctor, Freud, says to her, the reason you can't walk is the night that your father died you were supposed to give him his pills. You were supposed to take care of him. But you wanted to go out. You wanted to be young. And you didn't go. And you died. Now, when Freud said that to Kim Stanley, I was in the front row, OK? Her face literally turned red. I mean, beat red. And the tears started to explode out of her eyes. I was in the first row. I was 15, okay? I had never seen anybody do that live. 
She exploded in screams and terror and tears, and they started to bring the curtain down, and she was screaming, no, no, no! And the curtain came down, and she kept screaming in the dark. And then they brought the lights up, and everybody went, I mean, you actually saw somebody having a, an absolute trauma eight times a week. I have never seen a performance like that except James Earl Jones in The Great White Hope. And if you haven't seen that, which probably a lot of you haven't, get the movie. Greatness. I saw greatness. <laughs> As a young man, um, and this dream started to kind of grow in you, do you know what you were hoping or thinking acting would give you? Love, <laughs> attention, power, payback, <laughs> revenge. <laughs> I was incredibly healthy. <laughs> <laughs> I was an idiot. And then I woke up after many years of therapy, many, and working with Sandy Meisner, Stella Adler, working on stage uh, with Jerome Robbins, Neil Simon, and Michael Bennett, and Joe Layton, and Bert Shevelov, and they made me wake up. <laughs> they said, you work hard, Larry. You get off your ass, and you go to work. You go to class, you work out your voice, you work out your body, you read the great plays, you read the great novels, you go to the museum, you give something back. It's not about you. And this is my 43rd year of teaching, and I promise you all, actors, this is right. If you're waiting for somebody to give you it, there's no there there. There's just work. The joy to do a play to work with other actors, to work with great writers. Without the writers, if you don't know the great writers, listen, I was an idiot. I'm not, I'm not just saying that to be, Arnie, isn't he charming, he's being so self-effacing, that's horseshit. No, I'm talking about reading Strindberg and Ibsen and Shaw and you know Miller and, and Williams and um, all of the great, and clearly I've been seeing so much Shakespeare recently, you know, you know the greatest sell out on Broadway this year, Mark Rylance, yeah. doing Richard III at 2 p.m. and Olivia in Twelfth Night at 8 p.m. And you could go and watch him prepare. You could go in at half hour and he would prepare with all the other actors on the stage. So when he was playing Richard III, he was talking to the audience and patting people on the back. And it was so wild because he was doing politics. He was making friends. He was preparing to play Richard. When he played Olivia, they were fitting the dress on him. He didn't move a muscle. It was all internal. I went, that's an artist. And he had fun. That was within eight hours. Richard III and Olivia in Twelfth Night. Can you do it? <laughs> not very many can, and not very many people work with enough passion to be able to. It's just the truth. I wanted to... <laughs> Before you woke up, I just want to go back a bit. You describe yourself as a demented puppy in those early days as an actor in New York. And I've heard you say, and I'm sure hundreds of actors have heard you say, that the two things that stop an actor having a successful career psychological issues and lack of technique. Can you talk about those and the interconnectedness between the two? Isn't she excellent? This is Cam, <laughs> Cam Creegis who runs a 16th Street studio in Melbourne and they have invited me to teach there and it's a glorious experience. So thank you, Kim. Thank you. Um, yes. I think you all know that to be an actor is very difficult, you know? I mean, it's the old proverbial rejection. If you have insecurities, God knows acting will bring it up. If you want attention, if the casting director looks at you without support or, the, or they dismiss you and that goes too deeply into you, that's a psychological <coughs> problem. It's not personal. 
show business is the least personal experience in the world. <laughs> Nobody gives a rat's ass about you. The director is saying, can they make me look good? Can they, more importantly, tell the story that I want to tell? It's not personal. None of it's personal. When you, I, I had uh, uh, directed a wonderful play called Beast on the Moon off Broadway, and uh, a wonderful actor named Omar Metwali. Uh, some of you may know him. He's a wonderful actor, He's Egyptian, and he came in. He had to do a monologue, which he completely had to break down. I mean, deep, 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 watching his uh, family be murdered, seeing their heads on a clothesline. That's the memory he had to remember. Literally, their heads decapitated, hanging on the line. And Omar came in, and he just killed it. I mean, he was, he, that memory was real. And I went, as a director, I went, oh my God, could he do that again? So I said, Omar, come back tomorrow, same time, do it again. Because I was so moved by what he did, and I thought, does he have the technique to be able to do that eight times a week? And you know what? He did. He came right back and hit it. I went, you're hired. It's technique. It's not about, do you like me? Am I going to be a star? It's horseshit, everybody. It's crap. You can be as good as you want to be based on the passion you have to bring stories to life through character. If that makes you passionate, then look at Daniel Day-Lewis. I was fortunate enough to have a talk with uh, Steven Spielberg when he was uh, getting ready to shoot, or getting ready to do Lincoln. And he said, we want Daniel Day-Lewis so much. And uh, we just had a meeting with him to see if he'd do it. Daniel Day-Lewis came to the meeting with four portfolios about yay thick. He knew more about Lincoln for a meeting uh, uh, and uh, Steven Spielberg said, more than me or Tony Kirshner who wrote it. But when he realized how passionate they were, Daniel Day-Lewis said, yes, I'll do it. I need a year. That's how much homework he was going to do. So I, I get very emotional when I talk to actors because I, I am you. I know your hearts. I don't know you, but I know your heart, I know the desire, and I know the tragedy of laziness, the tragedy of entitlement, the tragedy of it's about me. It's not about you. It's deeply about you, and it's not about you. <laughs> and once you understand that, you're free. You're free to read the plays and bring them alive. And then maybe you'll get a movie that the world will see, like James Dean did in Daniel Day and Meryl Streep. Meryl Streep says, I never give a character less respect than I give my own life. I like that. Larry, is that tied in with, um, you said you made a decision at some point not to destroy yourself because um, learning about the craft of acting saved your life or mm. helped you to live. Mm. Can you expand a little more upon that? <laughs> oh, people. <laughs> I, 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 my um, mother was a paranoid schizophrenic. And so I grew up with a lot of terror. And when you grow up with mental illness, some of you I'm sure have, you never have a chance to find out your own self because you're always busy protecting yourself or wondering what's going to happen next. And when I saw the great actors, they mirrored back to me my own anguish. But they also, more importantly, mirrored back joy the joy of creativity. And I said, my mother is a sick woman and she's not going to get better. And my father has problems and I have to get out 
and go into the theater and find a way to live. And though it's a bit melodramatic what I just did, that I'm saying it because I want you to know that when I wrote my book, I didn't write <clears throat> the intent to act. I wrote the book called The Intent to Live. Because I think that's what great acting is. I don't think you can say, oh, that's acting. That's life. You go, oh, that performance. That's, that's, that's what life is like. I mean, what Jared Leto did in, in, uh, you know, the, in that uh, film, he, you go, that's not acting. He found the heart of that transgender person, and you felt their background, you felt their body, you felt their breath, you, you felt, you know, that goes beyond show business, way, 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 way beyond. He made people understand. Well, I did a movie called uh, The Green Mile and worked with the wonderful Bless him, Michael Clark Duncan. And he was very, um, very not wanting to work with me. Uh, <laughs> and uh, he said, uh, he never worked with a coach before, and they, they made him come to me. And he said, Mr. Moss, I don't want to be here. I said, well, Michael, I'm sorry. Sit your ass down, because you've got to get through me before you get to the screen test. So he did. He's about, you know, Michael, if you saw the movie, just. I said, Michael, tell me everything about you. And in about an hour, we were holding hands. <laughs> really. And his background was, you don't want to know. You don't. He said, Mr. Moss, how will I ever be able to do this in front of Mr. Hanks? <laughs> I said, you'll prepare like we've worked on, and you will give John Coffey life. OK, first day of shooting. First close-up, Michael Clark Duncan, off camera, Tom Hanks. He starts to prepare. His cheek starts quivering. Frank Darabont, wonderful guy, said action. And Michael delivered first take. And Tom Hanks walked away and said, Jesus Christ, which of course is who he's supposed to be, John Coffey. He's a, he's, a, he's a symbol. And after it, the movie had come out, and it was a great success, I said, how do you feel, Michael? And he said, Mr. Moss, he would not call me Larry. It made me so pissed. <laughs> I, I said, how do you feel, Michael? He said, Mr. Moss, when I used to walk into an elevator, people would back away. Now, they shake my hand. And that was Michael. And you watch that movie, and that's his soul up there. That's not acting. He delivered, and that's there forever. So I bless him because he was extraordinary. Sorry. There's, <laughs> um, there's another kind of personal question, and then I'm going to get into some craft-based questions. What did therapy, therapy give you, and have you ever pondered if you had not embarked upon therapy or met the right therapist, how your life could have played out? I'd be dead. I, I was brought up to destroy myself. And that <coughs> is just the way it was. But I didn't, but I also, my mother was interesting because I said my mother, my mother taught herself to play the piano. She was very poor and she was self-taught. She <coughs> actually taught herself how to, to play a piano. So she used to go after dinner and play the piano. And I would listen, and she would play all these ballads, these sad, sad, sad ballads. And she would read um, Eastern religions about Buddhism and Hinduism and philosophies and Freud and Jung, trying to figure out what was going on within her. And I thought, she gave me the choice between madness or creativity. And it was my choice. And I chose acting and writing and dancing and singing. And so when I sit up here and talk to you, 
my gratitude for our world of, of uh, writers and the great actors. We teach humanity. At, at our best, we teach people how to be human. I just, you know, it, you do a service every time you're honest in a movie or a theater piece. You give something. You know, so many people walk around, not just actors, people go, what can I get? What can I get? What can I get? You don't think about what you can give. If you're always saying, what can I get? It's like you don't have anything. When you say, what can I give? You're saying, I have something to give, right? What do you have to give? That includes your humor, your joy, your pain, your trauma, your silliness, your uh, imagination. You know, Stella Adler also saved my life because she introduced me to the great writers. I'm so sorry, people, that you didn't get to work with Stella Adler. Maybe some of you did. You did. So you know what I'm talking about, right? You studied Arthur Miller for two months. Not just his plays, but the man. Tennessee Williams, William Inge, uh, uh, George <coughs> Bernard Shaw, Ibsen, Strindberg. You knew the men and the women and Lillian Hellman. You knew where they were born. You knew what happened to them as children. You knew about their first play, their second play, what the themes were, why they wrote it. Uh, when you did Tennessee Williams, you had to read a book called Mind of the South. She said, you will never understand how to play Tennessee Williams if you don't understand what it was like to be in the South pre-Civil War. <laughs> and people, some people said, you know, uh, oh, I, I, I know how to play uh, Blanche Dubois and Amanda in Glass Menagerie. She said, no, you don't. <laughs> because you don't understand that the women were uh, hostesses, virgin goddesses. The men slept with the slaves and only slept with the women to procreate. Their sex lives were not in the home. The home was a refined, elegant, intellectual, historical, poetical masterpiece of, of um, a kind of elan, a kind of beauty. And that's why Blanche Dubois, White Woods, she said, how, how sad that I should be called a destitute woman when I have all these treasures locked in my heart and are not taken away by the years, but grow. Because she came from the South when it was high. Well, I didn't know that. In Pygmalion, when Eliza Doolittle does those funny, you know those funny uh, sounds? Ah! And everybody laughs in My Fair Lady when she's going to take a bath. Mm. Stella said, no, not funny. That young woman thought she was going to be put in ice cold water because the social class she came from didn't have hot water. She owned, they didn't bathe because they didn't have any heat. They had to bathe in ice cold water. So she was either going to be frozen to death or she was going to be scalded to death, and that's what made her go, go, oh, it's not funny. And I started to cry, and I went, I don't know anything. She said, the social economic experience of a person makes them who they are, their education, their economic life, and how they grew up. And I said, I'm an idiot. Thank you, Stella. I'll thank her till the day I die. She gave me the writers. <laughs> um, I'm just interested in that kind of movement in t uh, from you as a performer actor and becoming a teacher. You had a lot of very heightened moments in the theatre, the night at the improvisation, where you said that... Oh, you did your homework. <laughs> you had an experience where I think you say the audience's response was atomic and that you were able to pour every part of yourself into those songs. And then um, when you did Neil Simon's play, God's Favourite. So you had extraordinary moments as a performer and actor. And I think you said the electricity that you experienced was something you had never experienced before in yourself and never have since. How did you move from being an actor, performer, to becoming a teacher? And I think Warren Robertson, we were talking about that with Annalise before. Can you talk about that evolution? How that came about? You all love acting and you love music I know you do and you love great work 
it gives us a reason to live. And uh, Warren Robertson, who is a wonderful teacher, uh, said, I think you could be a teacher, and he gave me four students. And I sat down, and the first uh, scene was the big daddy and brick in Cat in a Hot Tin Roof. And I had done my homework. I really knew that scene. And <laughs> these two guys did it, and I sat in the chair, and I went, I'm home. I'm home talking about acting to actors. I'm not an actor, I'm a teacher. But then because I became a teacher, I kept getting jobs. <laughs> <laughs> because I figured if I could teach it, I probably knew how to do it. <laughs> and so I suddenly had this Broadway career where I was going from Broadway show to Broadway show to Broadway show. And then suddenly I, I went through some personal stuff and I went, I'm gonna take a year off, just teach. And I never went back. I said, that's not me. I, I wanna, I, I found teaching. I had something more important to do than be an actor. I was okay, I was pretty good. But uh, this, talking to you, makes me feel like I could explode. <laughs> Not because so much about me, I mean, I'm a neurotic guy, but that's okay, so are you. And women. But to be of service, to have it be about the story and the characters, I think to myself, somebody said something great. They said, if you're lucky by the time you die, your narcissism will be at, it low, at its lowest point. <laughs> What about me? You'll go, no, I loved you. I loved you so much. Thank you for loving me back. That's the end of life. Not the movie you made or the uh, award you won. It's about love. It isn't about all this crap. But when you give a good performance, that's love. James Dean will last forever. Every young man who ever had a problem with his father will watch East of Eden and go, yes, that's really how it is. Uh, rebel without a cause, giant. Um, you know, I was thinking about Marlon Brando and how in, uh, on the waterfront when he's talking to his brother and he says, you know, the, the famous, I could have had class Charlie, I could have been somebody instead of a bum, which is what I am. You know what Brando did? Of course you do, but you know what he really did? He's a, he was a fighter, a boxer. He showed his brother his cheek. I could have had class, Charlie. I could have been somebody instead of a bum, which is what I am. He was like a child, like a vulnerable, fragile, breakable piece of China. Only Montgomery Clift, John Garfield in the 40s, uh, Brando and Dean brought <coughs> masculinity and fragility in enormous quantities and changed acting along with the great Ken Stanley and uh, our goddess, I mean, I know it sounds bizarre, but I mean, when I watch Meryl Streep do Sophie's Choice and A Cry in the Dark and Death Becomes Her and Bridges of Madison County, and I say to my students, watch it without sound. Just watch her body language. You'll understand character acting. Now, listen to it and don't watch it. She has a different accent and a different rhythm and a completely different her voice work in The Devil Wears Prada, as opposed to Sophie's Choice, as opposed to Cry in the Dark, will amaze you. Daniel Day-Lewis in My Beautiful Laundrette, Room with a View, Last in the Mohicans, There Will Be Blood, and Lincoln, you go, oh, you mean character acting. You mean bringing a person to life. Not where some agents will say, just don't go to acting class, and don't go to voice class, and just go to the gym, really look great, and just be you. 
you just, just, you're so charming. Don't, don't act. You know, they go to the TV and they go, don't do anything. Do less. Do less. Don't do anything. Do less. Give me less. Now, for movies, sometimes you need to do that. But when you look at Jack Nicholson or Meryl Streep or Dan, Dan, Daniel Day-Lewis or Jimmy Cagney, you go, they were big. You know, do you all see Sunset Boulevard? Where William Holden says to Gloria Swanson, she's retired, he goes, you used to be big. She says, I am big. <laughs> it's the movies that got small. <laughs> Larry, speaking about being a teacher, Stella Adler said, the teacher has to inspire to agitate. You cannot teach acting. You can only stimulate what's already there. Do you agree? Yep. But you can inspire them to get off their ass. <laughs> and you know what does that? Somebody gets up in my class and they do this great piece of work. And everybody goes, that was fucking great. <laughs> that was great. And people are crying and they go, I want that. I want to do that. And you go, yeah, that's right. You, of course you do. It's not about my agent called me and said they like my ass. <laughs> you know, then I got a call from an agent and said, can you imagine? They said, do you have any young, pretty people? I said, I'm not a pimp. <laughs> I said, had you asked me, did I have a talented actor or actress, I would send you someone. Oh, you're getting old, you know, you're 25. Don't get me started. <laughs> you become actors. You go work on your voice. You work on the great plays. Some of you don't want to. Some of you are just lazy asses, and I don't care about you. <laughs> I don't. I care about the people that want to give something and want to work their eight hours every day, because that's what it takes. You know, a lot of people come from Hollywood and go on the stage. They don't do too well. Not because they're not talented, but they haven't been on the stage in 10 years. Denzel Washington goes back now, he goes back. You know, he did Julius Caesar, then he came back and did Fences, now he's doing Raisin in the Sun. That's fantastic. And he's wonderful on the stage. He has this amazing voice and just emotion and Viola Davis. And you go, you can look at that and you say, and Mark Rylance, my God, Jerusalem, Labette, Boeing, Boeing. Go to Lincoln Center and watch it on tape blow you out of the water. Not everybody wants to do that. I sometimes in class people do this great work and everybody gets hungry. And so I had this one young actor from Australia and he was in my class and everybody wanted him, all the agents wanted him, blah, 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 blah. I said, get out of here, <laughs> get out of here. He said, but you know, I manage as an agent. I said, get out, go to London. Mm, what he said. You have something mm. inspiring inside of you. Do your Shakespeare, do it now. You'll be 22, you'll know so much. He's doing Hamlet now in London. Sure. You wait till you get a load of this kid. I wouldn't let him get caught. I said, get out. Now listen to me, people, please. I know it sounds a little snotty. I don't look down on television or people that are doing series or any of that. It's fine, make money. Become famous, wonderful. But don't give up acting. <laughs> you understand? <laughs> oh dear, I didn't think I didn't say it the right way. Uh, <laughs> Don't, 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 give, don't give up character work. You know, don't play close to your skin all the time. Play a farce. Do some Shakespeare. Go, I've never done Shakespeare. Well, get off your ass and do some. Maybe you'll suck, or maybe. You know, I just saw King Lear. And I'd seen it a long time ago, but I'd never seen a real good production. And I went, oh my God. King Lear. Twelfth Night, Richard III, man, that, that, you know that we'll all be dead in a hundred years and they'll still be doing Shakespeare? You'll all be dead. 
but Willie will be still on, selling out on Broadway, and so will Tennessee Williams, and so will Arthur Miller, and so will Ibsen. Janet McTeer, a great English actress, did A Doll's House about 15 years ago on Broadway. Never saw the like. Never saw the like. So this is me about the, the work. And guess what? A lot of people said, you know, you're too arty, Larry. <laughs> you don't understand showbiz. So then some nice things happened to me with some well-known people. And somebody said to me, a friend said, I got a book deal and I got such stuff. And they said, well, you got everything. Because he was somebody who said, you don't understand the business. And then when I got all of it, they said, well, man, you got everything. I said, no. I just ate my piece of pie. Yours is rotting in front of you. And that was the end of that relationship. <laughs> I mean, he's a great guy. I love him, but I don't want it easy. I want to earn it. I had a great shrink, Gabriel de la Vega, the first Cuban analyst in America. Brilliant man. Bless him every day of my life. He said, Larry, you have to earn your death. You have to earn it. You are fucked up, man. <laughs> Is he still alive? No. He died right. I went to him five days a week for three and a half years, and then he died. <laughs> he earned his death. <laughs> Five days a week with me is nice. <laughs> Larry, what's the relationship between the facts and the given circumstances that a writer gives you and what an actor brings interpretively to that material? That's a mean question. There was an actor who will remain nameless, who did a writer who will remain nameless. But this particular writer is all about rhythm. And if you're off the rhythm of this writer, the play fails. And this particular actor took pauses <coughs> that the writer did not write for a moment of truth. The play died a thousand deaths. But this actor wanted to be methody and create moments. He said, get on with it. The writer needs to be, he's a verbal, intellectual writer. The words are everything. So when, a, when an actor says, I'm going to do, I'm only mad at Sandy Meisner for one thing, and I loved Sandy, he was a great teacher. He said, cross out all the stage directions. Wrong. Read them first. See if they're helpful. And if they are not, discard them. But don't be so arrogant as to say, it doesn't matter what Tennessee Williams said, or, or Ibsen, or Strindberg, or O'Neill, because everybody laughs at Eugene O'Neill, you know, terrifyingly, you know. What's he trying to say? What's the writer trying to say to you? What's the clue? The arrogance of saying, I'll say it any way I want to. You do Neil Simon with the wrong breath. You do John Patrick Shanley with the wrong breath. You do David Mamet with the wrong breath. You might as well write home for money. If you're not on the rhythm, you're not on the play. And I don't care whether you agree with me because you're wrong and I'm right. <laughs> That's just the news. Rhythm from Stella. Arthur Miller's rhythm is not Tennessee Williams' rhythm, it's not Ibsen's rhythm or Strindberg's rhythm or Shakespeare's rhythm. You know why the English are better than most of us? They are. Because they understand great writing. It's in their blood. They have to have voice. They have to have a body. They have to, or they can't get a job. So you look at Mark Rylance, and he just had a big bomb, a great bomb in London. He did a Much Ado About Nothing with the great James Earl Jones and Vanessa Redgrave. They were too old. It got murdered. Then he came to New York to do the uh, Richard III and uh, Twelfth Night and rocked Broadway. In other words, he went from a complete failure as a director to a huge success. And isn't that how our lives go as actors? <laughs> I mean, isn't, isn't that how it goes? And isn't that how it should go? Every time I direct, I go, don't direct, Larry. 
Why would you do rec? Why would you put yourself on the line? You don't have to. I go, I do have to. I have to stand up and be counted. I have the right to fail. Yeah, but you're a teacher. You have to know. No, I don't know. Sometimes I don't know. It doesn't make me bad. It makes me, I don't know. I'll find out. When you talk about the, I'd never heard it articulated this way and I thought it was fantastic. When you speak about the super objective, which is, needs to be justified from a very strong emotional reason, and that comes from a source which is either great pain, joy, or fear. Why is that so? Say it again. Okay. Super objective, and there's a justification for that particular driving Got force it. for a character. Thank you. Yeah? and that that is rooted in deep pain, fear, or joy. I always use cat in a hot tin roof. Maggie says to Brick, you can be young without money, Brick, but you can't be old without it. You have to either be young or with money, because to be without it is just too awful. I had two dresses when I married you, Brick, one my mother made from a pattern in Vogue, and one was a hand-me-down from a cousin I hated. There was an actress who brought that to Broadway, who came into the stage and said, break, break, one of those no-neck monsters hit my lovely lace dress with a hot buttered biscuit, so I have to change. She took the dress off, balled it up, and threw it in the corner. I said, play's over. Play's over. Didn't anybody hear what Tennessee said? How can you take the dress off and throw it in a corner? My imagination said, her mother died poor. She mm -hmm. says, Maggie, don't die poor. At the end of the play, she says to Brick, because she sees go downstairs, they're going to leave the money to Gooper in May. Says, uh, at the end of the play, uh, Maggie says to Brick, I really do love you, Brick. I really do, you know. And Brick says, wouldn't it be funny if that were true? Mm. There's the super objective. Mm. If I don't have money, I will die. Read the play and see if you agree. Um, when you look at King Lear, you say, what does he want? Well, he wants to be adored. He wants to be seen as a god. And when one of his daughters says, you're not, he banishes, has this tantrum, creates all this horror, faces horror in the last minute. He goes, I didn't know how to love. I wanted power. There's a very interesting book called The Betrayal of the Self. It was mostly about men by a German analyst named Arno Gruen. And he said, men choose power or love. And if you choose power, you will end up alone. And I thought that was very interesting. Willie Loman. You know, Stella said there isn't a performance of Death of a Salesman where you don't watch. She said, I used to go and watch the back of the theater and watch people watch Death of a Salesman when it was first done. You saw all the suits shaking. Mm. It was the only play where all the men could not stop sobbing because every man knew, go out and put a shine on your shoes, Biff, and tell a joke, and get people to like you. And he disdained Bernard having an education. And, and, uh, and uh, Biff says, you filled me so full of hot air. I'm nothing, Pop. I'm nothing. But Willie can't give it up. He kills himself and sees Biff as the football player with the touchdown. <coughs> the desire for power and love of all, the American dream. Uh, it isn't about who I am, it's what I do and what I show. Uh, you look and say, what drives me? Uh, Blanche in Streetcar. I wrote about it in my book. She says in the beginning, first thing that Eunice says to her is, are you lost, honey? 
And she says, I'm looking for the, uh, the Dubois, I mean, the Kowalskis, the come down from Dubois to Kowalski. And finally, she says, there is one thing that is a one unforgivable sin, and that is, that is deliberate cruelty, and it is the one thing that I have never, never, never been guilty of. And finally, she says, my young husband, I saw him in a room with another man, and we didn't discuss it, and then I went out on the dance floor, and I said something, I'm paraphrasing, and he went, and he got a gun, and he shot the back of his head off. It was because on the dance floor, unable to stop myself, I said, I saw you disgust me. It was because I killed him. And she said, never has there been any light brighter than that kitchen candle. And uh, Mitch says, you need somebody, Blanche. Could it be you and me, Blanche? And she says, suddenly, there's God so quickly. <laughs> I found a safe place. And the next scene, that bastard, Stanley, destroys her. For good reasons. In his point of view. But you said about the, 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 to find a place. She has no money. She has no place to go. She's molested a boy. She has nothing. And for one moment, her super objective, suddenly there's God so quickly. The great writers write from these places. That's what I'm trying to say to you. Read. Turn the goddamn television off. Don't watch it. See if you cannot watch it for a week. And read every night for four hours. I dare you. No, I dare you. It's a nightmare. Thank you. Larry, moving into directing, how did that happen? Oh, God, you've heard enough from me. I went to see Phantom of the Opera. <laughs> and everybody told me you're not going to be able to get into Phantom of the Opera when it first was in London. <laughs> but I went to a scalper because I said, I'm going to get in. <laughs> now, there's nothing wrong with Phantom of the Opera. It's lovely. It's a lot of candles and <laughs> boats and masks. And, <laughs> and then the chandelier came down. And I went, I don't... I didn't come to the theater to watch Chandler. I see that in the movies. So I walked away and I went, Larry, shut up. If you don't like it, why don't you go do something? Why don't you create something you do like and not be, you know, bitch about it? <laughs> so I went to my class. I did this exercise, which was a half hour of relaxation and breathing and muscle release. And then I said, think of a memory, something that happened to you. It could have been yesterday. It could have been 20 years ago and don't edit the first memory you have. Well, within five minutes, people were sobbing. I said, okay, now remember every, every sensory aspect of that memory, everything you saw, tasted, smelled, touched, and heard. Did it for 45 minutes. People were clutching themselves, clutching other people. It had hit a nerve. I said, tell the person next to you that story so you can hear it as a story. And then the other person told them their story. Then I said, bring it to the stage and play every character in your memory. Oh. And the syringa tree. A month later, Pamela Gein, great actress who had never written anything, brought the memory of her grandfather who was murdered by a Rhodesian freedom fighter on his farm in Johannesburg, South Africa. She played her mother, her father, her grandfather, who was murdered, stabbed 82 times. Uh, and herself as a child, and her African nanny, Salamina. In the back of my hairs, <coughs> she finished it. She said, I have no, no right to tell this story. And I said, if you don't, who will? I said, write it. The whole class had stood. First time in the history of my class, the entire class stood crying. I said, Pam, it's an important story. 
later she wrote it. I said, do you want me to direct it? She said, please. I said, I'll meet you tomorrow at 10 o'clock. We walked in, she said, where's everybody else? I said, there'll never be another person in this room but you, you're playing everybody, because you can. 24 people, four years of work. It's a good piece of theater. It came through us, it wasn't about us. We found a story we wanted to tell. You can read it, you can see it at Lincoln Center. It's a good piece of theater, I'm proud of it. I did it because I had to tell the story and this new play, Holding the Man, this opening at the Matrix on May 10th is about two boys who fall in love in Australia in high school, the jock and the kind of, not nerd, but pre-AIDS. Uh, they have a relationship for 15 years pre-AIDS. They both get AIDS and they both die. And it's a true story. <coughs> and it's an extraordinary autobiography and a beautiful play by Tommy Murphy, written originally by Tim Conagrave. There's the two boys who go for 15 years, they age, and four other actors who play eight, eight parts apiece. So we're in the middle of rehearsal and it's daunting. But they're fabulous Australian actors and it's a good story and I want to tell it. I hope I don't fuck it up. <laughs> Just on that point, uh, Larry, Ilya Kazan said when he spoke about East of Eden, he said, I don't move unless I have some empathy with the basic theme. In some way, the channel of the film should also be in my own life. I start with an instinct. With East of Eden, it's really the story of my father and me, and I didn't realize it for a long time. In, so, in some subtle or not so subtle way, every film is autobiographical. So for you, um, because I think many of us lost friends to AIDS and um, those boys went to school at Xavier College, a Jesuit school across the road from where I lived. And uh, it's a story that's a, a very important story uh, to be told. And it's a wonderful thing that a group of actors here in Los Angeles have formed what's called the Australian Theatre Company. And this is their first production. And um, certainly everybody in Australia has been wishing them well. And I noticed that I think I checked on their thing that they've reached, they've been seeking funding. And I believe they reached. We got it. That's fantastic. Yeah. That's really great. Really, really good. Well, the Australian actors, I uh, love Australia and I love teaching them. And to work with, you know, these, to work with Australians on an Australian story. Uh, that's heartbreaking and educational and I think what's important is AIDS isn't gone and a lot of young men are not using protection now and God forbid we should have because there's AZT and there's other drugs that are much more sophisticated nobody almost dies anymore but then a new strain will come in other words you can't be stupid, gay, straight, bi, whatever. You have to be careful. You have to honor yourself. This play is about love, but it's also about, you know, Uta Hagen said in class, um, innocence is the inability to understand consequence. Talking about Romeo and Juliet. Innocence is the inability to understand consequence. So I think that the Tim and John in this play had no idea AIDS was coming. Well, we didn't know the plague was coming. We didn't know tuber tuberculosis. Because it had a sexual connotation, it became more of a, do you know what I mean, more of a, but it's about responsibility. But what do you do if you don't know about it? You know, people want to demean gays or they, you know, in, in Africa right now, <coughs> in Russia. You take a look at the women's movement or the civil rights movement, you go, why would anybody have the right to tell another person that they don't have the right to be who they are if they act responsibly? And so you have to tell stories that are scary. This is a scary story. You do watch these guys die, and it ain't pretty. And he wrote it. Tim, Tim Conagrave wrote it because he said, I was loved from the time I was 15 and I couldn't accept it. And I gave my lover AIDS. I killed him. 
this book is in honor of his love, holding the man. It's also about football because John was a footy player in Australia. But that was something I didn't realize that yeah. holding the man is a it's football an athletic thing term. and it's a penalty. It's a penalty. For holding the man in football. I yeah. didn't know that. So interesting. Mm. The play is so interesting. Read the book. It's, mad. it's wonderful. Larry, I've got some questions now from the audience and also from uh, some questions from Australia from uh, actors and acting teachers in Australia associated with 16th Street. But this is the first one I'd like to ask from, uh, forgive me if I don't pronounce your name correctly, Seha Sabri, are you there? Hello, me. Oh, hello. Hi. Um, I'm doing it for you only because we can't mic you. Right. Thank you, Seha. Okay, here's the question. I'm an actor and I'm also a substitute teacher, so I believe in homework. Can you please give us homework? Something we can do every day to keep ourselves sharp. <laughs> There's a wonderful moment in Holding the Man where they're at NIDA, the acting school, and she says to the students, all right, now everybody, pick a partner and form a relationship. <laughs> Good, leave that partner and form another relationship. Good, now leave that partner and form another relationship and keep doing that for three years. Now, Everybody cry. Now cry on a neighbor. Now really break down. All right, shake it out. I know who that teacher was. <laughs> <laughs> That's my acting technique, is get emotional every day with text. Have four monologues you do every day. Do your vocal work. Work on animals. Go see the great films. Find a part and work on it every day that you want to play. Um, do something that scares you as a character. Something you don't think you could do but you'd love to do. In other words, be an actor. Yeah. <laughs> have, a, have four monologues you do every day. Two classical, two contemporary. And work on them every day. And make different choices, different intentions different physicality. Imagine if you did eight hours a day, every day, on your acting, instead of waiting for the goddamn phone to ring. What if you said to your agent, I'll call you back, I'm in the middle of my work. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm gonna be on a TV series, good for you. I hope you are. At the end of seven years, playing the same part over and over and over, who are you gonna be? I'm gonna be rich, I'm gonna be famous, yeah, you're going to be overexposed unless you get a movie. And if that movie's a hit, if, 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 to be an actor means you act. You go to regional theaters. You create a theater company like John Malkovich and Gary Sinise did, Steppenwolf, the group theater, where Slee Strasberg and Sanford Meisner and Harold Clerman and Stella Adler and Ilya Kazan and Bo Bobby uh, Lewis. Lewis. Do something. Give something. The, 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 all the different nationalities. I, I work with many uh, African American and, and uh, Japanese and Chinese and uh, Hawaiian, and people say they don't want us. I go, shut up. Hispanic. I go, shut up. I don't want to hear your problem. Go write a play. Go get a partner and make a play. Make a movie. Write a story. Shut up. I don't want to hear how hard it is. We're free to do what we want to do in this country. I want to hear your problems. Shut up. Go do something. This is a question from, I think, one of the finest actresses in our country, Kerry Armstrong. She's also a teacher, and her question is, how important is empathy in an actor, and do you believe empathy can be taught? Not to a sociopath. <laughs> When you have an animal, as corny as it sounds, and you're a child, and that cat or dog dies, and you hold it, or you have a little sister or a little brother, or you see your dad cry for the first time, or a best friend, and you feel pain, if you don't have that, you can't act. Empathy is 
identification and sensitivity to other people. Caring, loving, fighting for someone. Who would you die for? I had a great shrink who said, okay, Larry, who are you? What? Who are you? What would you die for? What do you stand for? That's a question. I see you all thinking. That's who you are. Who has moved me? Empathy, without it, you can't be a person and you can't be an actor. Okay. <clears throat> uh, I think probably the answer to this will be swift. This is from the associate director of the Actors Studio, Elizabeth Kemp. Her question is, do you feel actors these days don't read enough plays? <laughs> And if that is so, how is that impacting them artistically and their ability as a storyteller? Terrible. We've forgotten how to read. Mm. Well, you know, you're reading Dostoevsky, you're reading Tolstoy, you're reading Steinbeck. You know, you're say saying, oh my God, all the great American writers, I don't know them. Uh, Charles Dickens. I never read Dickens. Uh, I never read Hemingway. Sit in a book and imagine as an acting job, reading makes you work on your acting technique because you visualize it all. In other words, without reading, you're not working your imagination. You're just having it fed to you via the television and the internet. So you're weak in imagery. So reading when it goes, we're all going. You're going down, <laughs> baby. You're going down, unless you open a book. And understand what it is to have a love affair with a great book. <laughs> There's a wonderful book called Ironweed. It's one of my oh, favorite yeah. books. And I remember reading that book and thinking to myself, I'm the happiest man in the world right now, <laughs> reading this book. I just couldn't, I just, I wept when it was over. A book becomes your friend. Mm. Who is your favorite writer? Who is your favorite playwright? I read, because it's my job, I read all the time. And I'm so happy. And my television broke and I didn't get it fixed. <laughs> I could give a shit about television. Who cares? Unless it's a good cable show. <laughs> Great. And there are good television shows. Don't get me wrong. I'm saying, where are you going to be in 10 years? Do you th even think about it? You know, a lot of actors in the uh, days in the 50s and the 40s, they go, I want to play that part by the time I'm 30. And by the time I'm 40, I want to play that part. And by the time I'm 50, I want to play that. And then I want to do my, my, I want to do my Hamlet, and then I want to do my Lear, and then I want to do my Benedict, and then I, I want to do Stella, and then I want to do Blanche, and then I want, and then I want to do, uh, I want to do something like, like, like Meryl did in Sophie's Choice. I want to play uh, uh, a Russian or, a, uh, uh, how, you know, what's your blood memory? What's your nationality? Where did your great grandparents come from? Do you know that that blood memory from your great grandparents are the parts you can excel in? Like, I, I have Russian and English blood. I'm brilliant in those parts. Can't, can't catch me. It's in my blood. My mother was from New Orleans. I got it. I got it right in my heart. If you look at your, at your past and you start working on those parts in class, you won't believe what happens. You'll start to cry and you'll go, why am I crying? Why am I crying right now? My Jewishness. I remember I went to a Seder, and it's complicated my religious stuff, but they were doing the prayer of the Seder, and I was over my matzah, and I just started sobbing, and I went, what is that? What is that earthquake? And then I went to Germany to teach for the first time, and I stood in front of 200 artists in Germany, and I was shaking. And I didn't know why, and I looked out and I said, good evening, my name is Larry Moskowitz, and I'm a Jewish man. And I'm not saying it for any other reason to say that nobody in this room was responsible for anything that happened during World War II. But I'm afraid. And that's my problem. But I have to name myself. I couldn't even believe I said it. I couldn't believe I did it. But something in me had to. 
and uh, we became great friends. So that was good. <laughs> All right. Um, from Sharon. I'm not sure if Sharon tweeted from Australia or is here now. The question is, how do you assist an actor in finding proper vocal quality for a character? Great question. Great question. How many notes, meaning ah, how many notes does Stanley Kowalski have? How many notes does Maggie have? How many notes did Sophie have? How many notes did uh, the character, I'm thinking of Daniel Day now, because he found a high voice for Lincoln? He didn't do the, I'm Abraham Lincoln and I talk with a sonorous voice. He had kind of a high pitch because he did his research, right? Yeah, in the nose. Yeah, 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 yeah. Lincoln was renowned for it. Yeah, say it again, it was. Lincoln was very renowned for his nasally speech. His, his, his voice was very nasally. But most actors wouldn't have gone and found that, right? But Daniel did. So you go, how many notes are available to me? How many notes do I use every day? Some people have three notes. They talk here, they go there, they never go there, they go there, they go there, they go there. And you go to sleep. <laughs> and that's your acting. You, have, you don't have any notes. And then you see somebody who has access to their voice and has an interesting voice. Jack Nicholson has an interesting voice. Um, Humphrey Bogart had an interesting voice. Betty Davis had an interesting voice. What happened to our voices, everybody? Everybody sounds like they're 12. Hi. Even the guys. Hi. Uh, hi. 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 Shut up. Get a voice. So irritating, isn't it? All right, here's another question, and this is from, I think, one of the great voice teachers working in the world today, Rowena Bayless, who I believe I is love Rowena. over here. Rowena, a wonderful <laughs> voice teacher, Rowena Bayless. Hello, my sweet. <laughs> and Rowena is based in LA, but comes out to Australia very frequently. And Rowena's question is, in your workshops, I know how much you emphasize the importance of actors working on their bodies, voices, and speech, and I love that about you. What are the techniques, exercises, or images you use on the spot to help the actor embody the text or find the character's voice? Great question. Mm. You know what I do? I do a scene, and I have them stare straight out and listen to their partner. People say, well, I can't work off the person. Wrong. Sandy Meisner said, if you can't see them, you work off what you hear. So you're going, well, I, I'm, 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 I'm dependent on what the other, their behavior of the other person. No, you're not. You're dependent on what you hear and, and what the tone of hello is. You know, hello can mean, get out of my life. Hello can mean, I want to sleep with you. Hello can mean, you'll pay for that. So I make them listen, not only to the text, by not looking at their partner, but by hearing the emotional tone of the vowel. It's just one exercise. Obviously, you work off the person moment to moment. That's the very beginnings of acting. But there's so, so it's about respecting the text, hearing the text. Whenever anybody does Harold Pinter, which everybody should work on because he was genius to me. You know, in Betrayal, when, the, when, they, when you know, Emma and, uh, and Jerry says, um, so, how are you? Fine. You? Fine. It's been a long time. Yes. It's all bullshit. It's all a lie. But the English 
upper class at that time in history didn't go into the feelings until the end of the scene when she realizes she's lost her husband and her lover. She says, <clears throat> from hi, fine, and you, they keep asking each other, how are you? Fine, fine, and you, fine. No, how are you really? Good. And Robert, when was the last time you saw him? Oh, I don't know, I haven't seen him in a long time. Why? Why? And finally at the end, she says it's over. It's all over. From high to it's all over. Harold Pinter, baby. Did I answer the question? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, this is a question from Liam Seymour, an actor who's uh, currently on the full-time program at 16th Street. And he wrote, what are your thoughts on the tall poppy syndrome that is a classical curse amongst many artists in Australia? You all know what the tall poppy syndrome is, that you can't get too successful. You can't rise above others too much because they want to cut your head off. Nelson Mandela said, who are you not to be magnificent? Listen, this is not easy for me to get up here in front of you all. I mean, I'm looking at you, but you're all looking at me. And I'm supposed to have some sort of something. The little boy in me goes, God, I feel a little nervous. Am I doing OK? And the other part of me goes, you have a right to be here. 43 years. OK. I won't apologize. I won't apologize for my temperament. I won't try to get you to like me. I don't care if you like me. Thank God. I do care that maybe one person in this room is saying, you know what? I'm going to open a book tomorrow. If I did that for one person in this room, then being charming or likable doesn't mean anything. If you walk out of this room going, oh, I don't like him, fine. <laughs> you know, somebody said, if everybody likes you, you're not doing something right. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Yeah. I'll tell you one thing. I've got to tell you this really quickly. Stella Adler. <laughs> I always tell this story. Stella said, uh, a poor young, pretty blonde girl, poor baby, decided to do Golden Boy by Clifford Odets. And Stella had directed the national tour, and she knew Clifford Odets with it. So the, the, the great scene in the first bench scene in Golden Boy, S uh, success and fame are just a lousy living. You're lucky you won't have to worry about those things. And Joe says, won't I? Unless Tom Moody's a liar. Well, this poor young girl got this much out of the scene. Success and fame or stop! <laughs> stop! <laughs> I can't look at you. <laughs> Darling, you didn't read the play. You don't understand the depression in New York. You don't understand what it is to be on a park bench. You don't understand what it is to almost to be a prostitute. You don't understand anything, so why don't you go die? <laughs> and we all said, did she say die? Did, 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 she, did she say die? <laughs> die! If, and, and the girl ran out of the class, sobbing. And she said, run! <laughs> If you can't take me, how will you ever take show business? <laughs> Next! I said, well, I'm not going to ever get up in front of her. <laughs> she was terrified. <clears throat> Can you imagine? <clears throat> Darn! <clears throat> she didn't give a fuck whether you liked her or not. But boy, did she put a fire under your ass. Stella Adler, babe. God bless her. Well, you clearly had a different, made a different impression on an actor called Sonny Beecher. Two years ago, he came to your masterclass in done? Melbourne yes. as an accountant. And he's now uh, completing an acting program once again at 16th Street. I went into the class before I came here just to talk to them about coming over to interview you. And I mentioned that connection to him studying. And he sent me an email saying, Hi, Kim. You're 100% correct in saying it was because of Larry Moss that I am privileged to be studying acting. 
and not sitting at my desk in a small cubicle on level 26 of another building in the CBD making sure my credits and my debits balance. He inspired me with his words such as, charity starts at home, no one is coming to save you. Treat success and failure as the imposters that they are. People can spend their entire lives walking around in reaction to their childhood. Mm. At this stage of my journey, I would like to know how you get to a place where you don't only say these things and inspire people with your words, but also live them. There are dark times, shadows, fears and doubt. So the question is, how do you propel yourself into the work in times when self-sabotage seems to be the conquering thought? You know what they say about suicide? It's a, a if I find the right word, <clears throat> it's a decision that you can't take back to a temporary problem. Could you say that again? Well, I'm making it up because I don't have the quote right. Okay. But the idea is you can't take suicide back, but if you wait long enough and you don't kill yourself, it'll pass. We have anxiety attacks. We have moments of great doubt. We have moments of self-hatred. We have moments of guilt, of shame, of outrage, of murderous thoughts, of perverse thoughts. That's the human condition. I say every day, I love you, Larry, and I forgive you. Do the best you can today. Take nothing for granted, taste your food, and be kind. Don't hurt yourself, and don't hurt anybody else. And try to give something to somebody, try to give something, and have fun, <clears throat> and enjoy, enjoy this incredibly precious existence, every moment, even the bad ones. I had an anxiety attack very recently, it was bad, and I went, okay, what part of you is having that? Well, that part of me. But you see, that's what my shrinks helped me, they go, There's, we have different parts, and we visit them. When sometimes they visit us, they go, I'm terrified, I'm terrified, I want to die, uh, I, I, I want to kill that person. Uh, you know, I, I, sometimes people irritate me so much. <laughs> and I go, I just want to say, would you just shut the fuck up? <laughs> or people on motorcycles, don't you hate them? <laughs> no, I always want to shoot them. Now, people have a right to ride motorcycles, but the ones that are loud, so I have this fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> Larry, that's a murderous fantasy. I go, yeah, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> I don't want the bastard to die, but shut up. It's passing. I remember I fell in love with someone. It was awful. It was awful. No, 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 no. Awful. <laughs> Took about 20 years. <laughs> to fall in love or out of love? Both. Right. <laughs> I got over it. I got over it. Now I think, I, if I saw the person, I'd go, hi, how are you? Uh, actually, you were really my mother. I projected my mother onto you. That was the problem. I was your mother? You're my mother. Oh, wow. Hmm. You gotta stay with it. You gotta keep saying, what's that about? What's that about? I'll get through it. I'll get through it. How does anybody get through an opening night? Or the first day of shooting? Or your big scene? You breathe. You give yourself some love. You concentrate. You do the best you can. And you go on. You know, being egocentric, it's all about me, 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 and what the world did to me is a sad way to live, and you don't have to live that way. You can change it by simply, as corny as it sounds, asking somebody else about themselves. How are you? How was your day? And you may not care, 
but maybe they'll say something really interesting. You know, we're more alike than we're different. Mm. If every person got up on this stage and told their life story, there wouldn't be a dry eye in this house, and there would also be shock how some of us have survived. There are stories in this room that you can't even imagine in every single one of you, and therefore in every single character you play. What's their fear? What's their secret? What happened to them? Why do they behave that way? Why? You're a character. What would somebody have to know about you to play you? Isn't that a good question? If someone had to play you in a movie, what would they have to know? You should write down a paper that said, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. The secret, what would be the secret they have to know? You gotta go to the, sometimes the dark. So I don't want anybody to ever know about that. But what would it feel like if they did? Oh, there it is, it's the oh, you wanna find. Then the behavior on top of the oh. Charming, friendly, lovely. I don't wanna go to the oh. <laughs> you know, everybody has secrets, everybody has fears, everybody has shame, everybody has curiosity. But also, somebody else said to me, my last therapist said, you know, Larry, joy is more profound than sadness. I thought that was pretty incredible. And I got it. I said, why are we afraid of joy? No, I mean, not, not everybody, but, but it's... And then I read, uh, read this book, The Denial of Death by Ernest Becker. Mm -hmm. You should read it. He says, Ernest Becker won the Pulitzer Prize in the 70s. He said, we can't have joy because we can't face our death. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We are egocentric. We cannot face the fact that in a hundred years we'll all be gone. So we won't really let joy in because you know when somebody has a moment of great joy they'll go, this is too much. I can't take it. I'm too happy. This is too great. I can't stand it. It's, oh my God, you know that feeling? It's the terror of death. Instead of saying like the Buddhists, we're gonna die. Yeah. Better taste your Wheaties. You're going to die. Everybody. So what does it all mean? It, the, there was a, a, a philosophy called the Forum. And the Forum yeah. said, remember that? Sure and the Forum said, life has no meaning whatsoever. Only the meaning that you bring to it. I like that. Mm. I thought that was interesting. What did I do today to bring meaning to my life? God, shouldn't I just shut up? No, it's just, I wish oh we had God, more it's time. So um, I'm so sorry I didn't get to ask more questions. The writing was a little difficult for me, so please forgive me, but maybe there's some time after we finish live streaming for a couple of more questions. Larry, thank you so, so much for spending I this time with us here.